Chapter 23, Self-Government, Federation, and the Independence of Jamaica and Trinidad. We can think of West Indian history as a climb up a flight of stairs. The first flight was from slavery to freedom. Then the climb to better standards of living could really begin. It is still going on. A most important step is that from colony to independent country. Jamaica and Trinidad with Tobago moved up in 1962 to become fully independent. Haiti, Santo Domingo, and Cuba were formerly the only other independent island states in the Caribbean. The new motto of Jamaica, out of many one people, suggests another flight up. This motto points to a time when differences of race or color will no longer be important. We think of this because the West Indian population is a great mixture. It is drawn from Africa, Europe, and Asia. Negro, East Indian, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and British elements are clearly marked in Trinidad. The mixture in the other islands of the British family is also great, although less so than in Trinidad, and Negroes are in the majority. The same may be said of British Guyana, except that their East Indians outnumber Negroes. In British Honduras, the other mainland territory, there are Maya Indians, descendants of the early inhabitants, as well as Negroes, Europeans, and Caribs. This great mixture gives West Indians a chance to enrich their civilization from the many peoples of which they are composed. The condition of the West Indian people today is the result of the influences of many forces, of which we shall mention a few. The missions and the churches made themselves responsible for the elementary education of the laborers and the peasants until West Indian governments assisted them in the task. Later on, they built and maintained secondary schools too. Long before the sons of planters at schools like Monroe and College in Jamaica, Harrison College in Barbados and others. These are open today to anyone who can afford the expense or win a scholarship or free place. As we have seen, the people secured lands, planted new crops, and improved their condition largely through their own efforts. When opportunities came, they traveled to and worked in Panama, Costa Rica, Cuba, and the United States, earning for themselves better standards of living on their return to the islands. Many, of course, settled in the new countries. Since World War II, there has been heavy migration to Britain, and in the middle of 1962, there were about 300,000 West Indians there. However, the British government that year brought into force a law discouraging the free entry of outsiders, and so this outlet for West Indians was almost closed. On the whole, emigration has had a beneficial effect upon the life and earning power of West Indians at home. The University of the West Indies, established in 1948, is carrying education to the highest levels and helping to advance West Indian civilization. Most people now understand that a good education is the best preparation for a good life and that youth should be trained to use the hands as well as the head. West Indian governments and people are therefore spending large sums of money on education and are not forgetting the importance of technical and vocational training. The opening of the Panama Canal for traffic in 1920, linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, was greatly increased the value of many harbors in the West Indies, especially of Jamaica, which are now on a main world route. The canal has made the Caribbean Sea of immense importance to the United States. And during World War II, the Americans protected this area from an enemy attack. In 1940, an agreement was made between the British and American governments by which the Americans were allowed to build naval and air bases in Trinidad, Jamaica, St. Lucia, and Antigua. In this way, the British West Indies have played an important part in strengthening the ties of friendship 
between the United States and Britain. From 1959 to 1962, Cuba was drawing to itself the attention of the whole world. It appeared that the country was being turned into a communist state by Dr. Fidel Castro, who had driven out the dictator Fulgencio Batista and taken over the reins of government. Many Cubans fled to the United States where communism is greatly opposed and tried to defy Castro from there. With the help of some Americans, they attempted to invade island landing at the Bay of Pigs, but the attempt failed. This and other matters were the cause of much bitterness between the United States and Cuba. In October 1962, President Kennedy discovered that with the help of Soviet Russia, an arsenal of dangerous long-range weapons, missile bases, and swift bomber plan planes were being built up in Cuba, and he at once demanded that the bases be broken up and the missile moved. He also ordered the American Navy to search all ships going to Cuba and to turn back those carrying offensive weapons. The fear of war once again hung over the world, more so over the West Indies. The Jamaicans, less than 100 miles south of Cuba, wished they were farther away. Castro demanded that the United States give up its powerful naval base at Guantan Guantanamo, which is on Cuban soil. The United States refused. Eventually, the quarrel between the nations died down and the fear of war was removed. One of the greatest anxieties of the West Indian people since World War II has been to achieve political independence within the British Commonwealth in as short a time as possible. Development of wealth and increase of earning power are matters of the greatest importance because of their connection with standards of living, but they take on new importance when it is remembered that the best kind of political independence is that which is supported by living standards which people earn for themselves. It is necessary, therefore, to describe briefly some of the new ways by which West Indians today earn their livelihood and try to improve their standards of living. In the smaller territories, there is as yet little development in the manufacturing industries, apart from sugar and rum, canning factories, and handicraft. In Jamaica and Trinidad, however, there has been rapid expansion in manufacturing. Today, there are hundreds of factories in Jamaica employing well over 30,000 people and producing a wide range of goods, too numerous to mention, but including textiles, tobacco, nails, paper, cement, plastics, gramophone records, matches, metal windows, and a large array of food products. Apart from the older industries, especially oil and asphalt, for which Trinidad is famous, her industries include glass making, spinning and weaving, cement making, and the manufacture of rubber goods, typewriters, and adding machines, etc. In British Guyana and Barbados, too, considerable development has taken place. Much of this expansion has been due to the establishment of industrial development corporations, the first of which was set up in Jamaica in 1952. But this is not all. Within 15 years or so, Jamaica became the world's leading producer of bauxite. British Guyana also has a large bauxite industry. Mention must be made too of the growth of the tourist industry, particularly in Jamaica. Although in other territories, similar development has begun or is being contemplated. The trade unions have kept pace with the growth of industries and have developed close contact with the political movements throughout the area. Trade union organizations have been very active and have secured numerous benefits for the workers, particularly in regard to increased wages, better conditions of work, sick benefits, old age pensions, etc. With regard to government, a British territory may be compared to a human being growing in power and responsibility. Crown colony government is the start and may be compared to infancy and childhood. At this stage, the colony has little or no part in its own government. The whole responsibility rests with the Secretary of State for the colonies who appoints a governor, usually with a council, to advise him. 
The second stage has been called semi-representative government. In this stage, the colony growing up politically is allowed some share through the use of a legislative council, partly elected by the adult citizens, partly nominated by the governor. Again, in this stage, all or most of the responsibility rests with the Secretary of State acting through the governor. Beyond this stage, when the colony is growing into manhood, government becomes more complicated, sometimes comprising two houses, a lower and an upper, corresponding to the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Jamaica and Barbados, which has never been a crown colony, have always had two houses. The other territories have had one, excepting British Guyana, which was granted a bicameral, two-house legislature in 1953. In January 1954, British Guyana reverted to the Crown Colony stage at a time when it was feared that the government was in danger of communist control. Since then, however, a new constitution has been brought into being and elected members, some of them ministers, have a majority in the legislature as before. In most places, there is also an executive council, which is a small body composed of elected members, senior civil servants, and other nominated members with the governor as chairman. As the colony matures, becoming more and more responsible for its own affairs, fewer and fewer civil servants are included in the executive council. And in the most advanced stages, even the governor is left out. The executive council then becomes a cabinet. In 1944, Jamaica was granted a new constitution for which the People's National Party had for years been agitating. The House of Representatives was for the first time elected by universal adult suffrage, suffrage, every adult having the right to vote. From that time on, Jamaica has never looked back in her progress towards full self-government, which she was enjoying by 1959. Similar developments had been taking place in other British West Indian territories, especially to enable them to enter the Federation as self-governing units. The Federation included the 10 territories comprised in Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, and the Windward and Leeward Islands, British Honduras, British Guyana, the Bahamas, and the Virgin Islands did not belong to it. Briefly, the Federation came about in the following way. Most West Indian islands have at some time in their history been governed as part of a group. In the Eastern Caribbean, particularly, groups broke up and were remade when, for example, a member changed hands between the colonial powers, France and Britain chiefly, or when there was a quarrel. The British Leeward Islands were for a long period under a single governor. So were the Windward Group. The idea of a federation grew among the British Islands and for over a century, it was often talked about, but finally dropped. In 1945, the Secretary of, State, Secretary of State for the Colonies proposed that the matter should again be considered, this time in connection with the promise of Dominion status. In September 1947, the Secretary of State presided over a meeting at Montego Bay where the question of Federation was discussed and certain recommendations were made. The legislatures of several of the islands reported in favor in 1950. In 1951, a commission which had been inquiring into the desirability In 1951, a commission which had been inquiring into the desirability of a customs union with the British West Indies reported in favor of such a union. This meant that the territories would have a common tariff or tax for imported goods and some free trade among themselves. These things, it was thought, would strengthen their economic position and help to foster local industries. The 1950 report stated that the Federation was the shortest path to self-government, recommending that the federal government should have a lower and an upper house, the House of Assembly and the Senate. The Senate or upper house would be nominated by the governor general. There would also be a council of state, which would be the principal executive body 
and which would consist of ministers chosen from the elected members and certain members of the Senate, with the Governor General presiding. Further conferences in 1953 and 1956 amended and put finishing touches to the first West Indies federal constitution. And in April 1958, the first federal parliament was opened in Port of Spain, which had been chosen as temporary capital of the Federation. The prime minister was Sir Grantley Adams of Barbados and the governor general, Lord Hales. In all federations, there is a division of responsibility between the states that make up the federation and the federation itself. In the West Indies Federation, subjects like higher taxation, external affairs, currency control, immigration to and migration from the federation were among the matters for the federal government alone. These subjects formed what was called the exclusive legislative list. Subjects like civil aviation, customs and excise duties, development of industries, quarantine, shipping, and many others were to be dealt with both by the Federation and the state governments. These subjects comprised the concurrent list. Certain other subjects were left to state governments alone, but there were several causes for disagreement. One was the demand in the smaller islands for free movement of West Indians within the Federation. Then there was the difficult matter of customs union, which affected Jamaica most seriously because a large part of her revenue came from customs duties. Above all, however, was the question of what power the federal government should have to raise money by taxation. Here again, it was Jamaica who felt strongest. Being so far away, the Jamaica people had had very little to do with the Eastern Caribbean, and they couldn't see why their affairs should be managed from Port of Spain, the capital of the Federation, a thousand miles away. Sir Alexander Bustamante, leader of the opposition in the Jamaica House of Representatives, saw how the people felt and challenged the ruling party under Mr. Manley. He said he wished to take Jamaica out of the Federation and called upon Mr. Manley to let the people decide for themselves by voting. So on September 19, 1961, a referendum was held and the vote went against Federation. Jamaica withdrew and sought independence on her own. Trinidad felt that without Jamaica, she could not shoulder the task of providing help to the poorer islands. The government therefore led by Dr. Eric Williams decided to follow the example of Jamaica and leave the Federation. Dr. Williams declared, however, that Trinidad and Tobago would consider the formation of a single state with any small island wishing to join it. Shortly afterwards, a new government was elected in Grenada on a call for such a union. So the Federation, scarcely five years old, came to its sad end. Jamaica became independent on August 6, 1962, Trinidad and Tobago doing the same on August 31st. A smaller federation of the remaining islands, the Little Eight, has been discussed. Their main difficulty is lack of money and other resources.